Hello friends, welcome back. Myself Pushpinder Singh, and uh, we are going to start with our daily current affairs. So today you have 14th of July 2021, and uh, you know these lectures are useful for those who are preparing for the civil services examination, which is conducted by the UPSC, right? Uh, these lectures are also useful for other government competitive examinations also, and uh, you can uh, supplement your preparation with the help of these lectures because they are entirely based on the current affairs of the or the day-to-day -day, uh, news. Alright, so let's begin with the lecture. So first news is all about the Saint Queen Katevan, right? So here the external affairs minister, Mr. Jashankar, basically handed over the Georgian government, you know, uh, the relics of the Queen Katevan, right? Uh, specifically, who was the 17th century saint, right? The Queen Katevan was basically murdered by a Safavid, you know, empire. She was murdered and later her relics were basically brought to the Goa or India, right, by the Augustine monks after her death. And uh, these basically relics were basically kept at the St. Augustine complex. At Goa and later this St. Augustine complex was also abandoned. So these relics were basically first discovered in 2005 all right and uh, in 2013 the DNA testing was basically conducted okay and which has confirmed their authenticity and which has prompted the Georgia to seek their return. So almost 400 years after she was murdered by the Safavid Empire in the Iran, the relics of the Saint Queen Katevan, who was a monk, was found in Goa in 2005 when it is likely to be displayed in India as well as her native Georgia, according to Archaeological Survey of India. So here, the Jashankar have handed over the one part of the relics to uh, as a gift to the Georgia, right? It has been confirmed by the Archaeological Survey of India officials and it has been kept, the relics was there at the Saint Augustine Church, which was uh, at the old Goa in 2005, it was later abandoned, right? And she was killed in 1624 in Shiraz, right? Definitely by the Safavid Empire, who was uh, forcing her to convert to the Islam, and she was refused to convert to the Islam, and ultimately she was killed. The remains were ultimately brought, right, by those Augustine monks, specifically to the Goa, in this, uh, you know, Saint Augustine Church. So here. After you know her method, the relics were remains lost till 2005 and later it was discovered, right? And uh, it has been confirmed also by the DNA analysis that these relics were belongs to the saint, you know, uh, who was basically you know the most important saint belong to the church. Yeah. The officials said the larger part of the relics remains with the archaeological survey of India, and that will be displayed to the public for the first time. Okay, and the smaller part was handed over by the Jayashankar, who was our external affairs minister to the Georgia, right, which is also likely to be displayed in the Georgia, and it was considered as a gift from it, from the people of India to the people of Georgia. So Katevan was basically a queen. She was a queen of the Kakheti, right, which is a kingdom, right, kingdom in the region of the eastern Georgia, right. And the queen basically resembles the same name. The Kaheti was basically a smaller kingdom, right? That basically nested between the two mighty empires. That at that point of the time, the Kaheti kingdom was basically in between the two mighty empires. The one was Ottoman Empire, right? That is the present day you have the Turkey. And the second is basically your Safavid Empire. Okay? That the Safavid Empire in the present day Iran. So Ottoman Empire belongs to the Turkey and Safavid Empire belongs to the Iran. So here, you know, the or according to the Orthodox Church, the Katevan was basically born in the royal family and ultimately she was married to the David, right? And ultimately she resembled to the throne and ultimately uh, she was capped and was forced to convert to the Islam, right? And then ultimately she was killed, okay? And then her remains were basically brought to India 
right later it was found that the remains was also belongs to her so the queen katevan was canonized as a saint by the georgian orthodox church after her death and her place as a subject of the veneration is also attributed to her the courageous stand i mean the demand of a possible conversion by by the islamic empire called sabhavid empire right and this orthodox church also account some credit which has also delay related to the preventing the islamization of the georgia at that point of the time okay and the georgian orthodox church remains one of the most powerful bodies in the country of the georgia since 2013 okay next you have the india's first green hydrogen mobility project so here a subsidiary of ntpc national thermal power corporation of india limited right have recently signed an mou this mou was signed right with the union territory of ladakh as well as the ladakh autonomous self development council for the purpose of the setting up of the country's first you know green hydrogen mobility project so here the most important aspect is that the rel which is the renewable energy limited okay renewable energy limited which is also a subsidiary of the national thermal power corporation of india limited have signed an mou right it is basically planning to set up the first green hydrogen mobility project in the region so this signing of this mou you know is also important mark for inauguration of the ntpc's first solar installation in the leh which is also a part of ladakh recently the ladakh had converted into the union territory by the jammu and kashmir reorganization act 2019 right so here the solar installation in the form of the solar trees and the solar car port okay and the ntpc has also planned to ply the five hydrogen buses right these five hydrogen buses uh, in its pilot project in this region of the leh right and the company will also setting up this solar plant and the green hydrogen generation unit in the leh also for that purpose so it's a it's a more important aspect is that the company is planning to have right or planning to develop the carbon free economy specifically in the region of ladakh so it's a most important aspect that the ladakh will become the carbon free over the period of the time it is based on the renewable energy sources as well as the green hydrogen and it's also the line with the prime minister's vision of the carbon neutral ladakh so it is an aggressive push by the ntpc by right, to uh, to basically to invite the tenders for procurement of this five hydrogen fuel cell buses for the deployment in leh along with you know they will be also deployed in other parts of the country also so the ntpc has been aggressively pushing for greening its portfolio and this green hydrogen project is another step towards achieving the low carbon footprint by the ntpc okay so it's an important aspect that promoting the uses of green hydrogen based solutions in the sectors like mobility energy uh, chemicals and fertilizers etc is also mean you know uh, in the renewable phase all right next you have the karman line so here you have seen the news that on july 11th the british businessman the richard branson have you know beat the jeff bezos to reach to the age of the space that is basically named as the karman line okay and uh, the various space enthusiasts as well as experts right uh, they believe that to reach that height it would basically turn as a space would definitely you know uh, increases the space tourism around the world specifically in the united states of america so it's a most important aspect that such type of uh, you know the space car that is reaching to the karman line will definitely increases you know uh, uh, the space tourism during that period of the time so here the most widely accepted boundary of the space that is known as karman line that we are talking okay that is around 100 km above the mean sea level okay and uh, the united states basically uses you know 80 km as a cut off point okay what is that cut off point that is basically you know that beyond that it is not not possible or not permissible right but the bronson's virgin Gal galactic flight that have you know uh, reached to the height of around 86 km while the jeff bezos the blue origin flight is expected to go around 106 km high so both 
both of these business persons the richard benson and jeff bezos right they are competing right against this space tourism to go to the maximum height right up to the kerman line or beyond that kerman line okay so it's a very important aspect now the kerman line have been compared with the international waters just like international boundary right so there was no national boundaries or you know or no human laws in the force beyond this line okay so above this there would be a free space that can be used so specifically the outer space treaty okay the outer space treaty that basically deals with the kerman line specifically with that aspect and it has been named after the aerospace pioneer the thorder von kerman who was basically also known or this name was also against this you know the important you know the personality for that war for that war, purpose all right and uh, the kerman line is based on you know the 1967 outer space treaty that the space should be accessible to all countries and uh, they should be freely used right they can be freely scientifically investigated so defining a legal boundary for what we call the space can help to avoid some sort of disputes or you know to track some sort of a space activities in the space human travel also okay some countries including you know the united states believe that by defining and delimiting this outer space is not necessary okay and the united nations meeting was held in 2001 right there was no legal or no practical problem that had been arising in absence of such definition so there was no need of such defining of such type of you know definition regarding the space and beyond the kerman line it is a free space just like the international waters okay and, and i told you that it has been named after you know uh, uh, the most important that the most small personality mr kerman so here you can say that you have the different layers of the atmosphere this these are the basically layers of the atmosphere the first layer is troposphere second is stratosphere mesosphere thermosphere and exosphere okay when you say about the troposphere you might have studied uh, in your geography books right the troposphere basically start at the earth surface right for example this is your earth surface start from the earth surface and it ultimately reach to about 14.5 kilometers on an average 14.5 kilometers high right the stratospheric height is around 50 kilometers that is around 50 kilometers from the earth surface as you know the mesospheric height is around 85 kilometers from basically the earth the thermosphere that we are talking about that height is around you know around 600 kilometers from the earth surface okay that is for your information an exosphere that we are talking that is around 10000 kilometers from the earth surface what we are talking about this 100 kilometers just so that lies you know within this limit that is called the mesosphere or just beyond the mesosphere but definitely below your thermosphere so it's most important aspect okay so next you have the caste violence so here the supreme court on monday agreed to hear the bihar government's appeal against the acquittal by the patna high court you know some some uh, you know accused persons specifically in the senari maskar in 1990 okay so what is this senari maskar and why uh, the supreme court has have been agreed to hear right regarding such appeal by the bihar government so here the most important aspect is that this senari maskar so on march 18 1999 the 34 upper caste men was basically forced out of their homes in the senari village of you know in the jinanaba district of jharkhand where they have been you know killed and slaughtered by the cadres of the moist communist caste center which is also you know elite the moist things so they have been killed right at that senari village of jinanaba district so here the patna high court basically acquitted the 13 accused persons in the senari maskar case where the 34 persons were basically killed on uh, march 18 1999 right by this moist group so here the most important aspect is that you have to go back to 2016 right where the additional district judge of the jehanabad you know district basically have convicted 
and awarded the death sentence to around 10 accused persons. So 10 people were basically awarded a death sentence and basically the remaining were basically the remaining three were awarded you know uh, the life imprisonment at that point of the time as many as 23 accused person was basically acquitted by the additional district judge of Jihanabad district right and later the division bench of the Patna High Court you know uh, basically dismissed the lower court's order so here all 13 accused persons of the Senari Mustar basically was caught free for the lack of evidence so that means the, the Patna High Court have released all accused in the absence of you know uh, the evidence so those were acquitted were basically belongs to definitely from the lower caste community because here the 34 upper caste persons were basically mascar so here this caste war that we are talking is basically originated specifically in the Bihar so here the Jharkhand is basically was a part of the Bihar at that point of the time as you know that the Jharkhand was basically born in the year of 2000 where the Bihar was basically you know uh, divided and it was basically reorganized in the form of the Jharkhand and the Bihar. So here the, the caste war which is basically raised you know the central Bihar in 1990 specifically right there was banned moist communist center who killed these 34 people belongs to the upper caste specifically the Bhumihar community. So here the most important leader at that point of the time was the Ranveer Sena which was led by the Brahmeshwar Mukhya who was jailed in 2012 right. So this mascar has said to be fallout of you know the Lakshmanpur mascar. The Lakshmanpur mascar where the 57 Dalits were killed in 1997 right in the Bihar itself and later after this Lakshmanpur you know mascar this Senari mascar was carried out by this moist cadre to take the revenge from this upper caste person specifically the Bhumiyar community right so specifically the Bihar is notorious for such type of caste wars right between the lower caste and the upper caste in that you know matter so you can see here the dead bodies where the people were basically mascar right uh, uh, because of these caste wars okay next the directive on the copyright in the digital single market so here the most important news is that the Google which is the tech giant have been fined with 5 million euros right by the French competition authority for failing to negotiate in the good faith with the news organizations over the use of their content. So idea is that this directives on the copyright in the digital single market was basically the directives given by the you know the France competition authority to negotiate with the news organizations for uh, for the uses by these Google or another tech giants without compensating the authors right they are basically using their contents without compensating them so these directives on the copyright in the digital single market is the directives given by the France to compensate those authors right while using their content right in the free of cost so there the france was basically the one such country which was focusing on the compensation to those authors so google was ordered to the present right an offer of the remuneration to the publishers within the two months right in that respect or risking the fines but the google was done its best despite of that the five million euros was basically fine so it is one of the largest ever fine that was imposed by the France Competition Watchdog that is the French Competition Authority over the not adherence with these directives on the copyright in the digital single market right. So it has been fined with the 500 million euros and this is a skirmish in the global copyright battle between the tech firms like Google and the news organizations which are running all across the world including you know uh, the France. So, uh, these fines were basically you know was imposed on the Google to fail to comply with an order to negotiate a fair deal with that the news organization so here the uh, the France competition authority was basically ordered right to uh, to put that fine over the Google so last year the French competition authority was ordered to negotiate with such deals with the Google with other news publishers right and the French competition agency took the issues and uh, it's saying that the discussion or the on the remuneration or the remuneration for the current users of the content 
that was you know covered by uh, the rights for the press should be negotiated and the regulator also added that google restricted the scope of the talks right with the media by refusing to include the use of the press images so it was the largest ever fine that was imposed by the france competition was stopped over such type of you know the tech giant like google specifically and um, it's a very very important that the google was also said that uh, you know it is despite of the best effort the google was basically fine so they have you know not happy with the step that was taken so here the recorded fine is basically the ongoing copyright battle between the google and facebook as well as the news publishers and here the france is not the only country who is uh, the taking the google to the task of the compensation for the news organizations the australia last year also required the google or the facebook who are the tech giants to pay the media outlets right for the right to feature their stories specifically to the publishers and as you know that you have you might have also uh, heard about this news that the facebook initially refused at that point of the time to the australian organization at that point of the time uh, you know restricting the australians from viewing or sharing the news content but you know later coming to the agreement with the government and, and the facebook also you know have some agreement with the publishers with that respect so what is that directive on the copyright in the digital single market so it is basically you know it's a european union directive which are basically adopted to came in the force in 7 june 2019 so main purpose is to uh, is to have the well functioning marketplace for the copyright and to compensate the due share to the publishers in that respect and definitely it is extending to uh, to the basically Euro european union copyright law okay with that respect and uh, it is competent of the european union digital single market project in 2000 in 2019 specifically you know the the first become the first european union country to transpose this digital copyright directive into the law and which has basically prohibited such type of uses of uh, you know the content without compensating to the publishers in that respect this law is also governed by the neighboring rights right which are also designed to compensate the publishers as well as the news agencies for the uses of their materials in that respect okay next you have the cabo delgado what is cabo delgado the cabo delgado is basically a region is basically a region right in the mozambique specifically so here the european union right have approved the military training mission in the mozambique to support the armed forces to protect the basically the population of the mozambique so there you have the islamist terrorist or the islamist jihadist terrorist in the mozambique right the deadly insurgency is basically going on by this militant which are linked with the islamic state group that has raised you know uh, you know the gas risk gas gas risk this cabo delgado the cabo delgado was basically a province right and it is also the gas rich right so their their natural gas was basically explored in that region and it has almost killed 3000 people right in this massacre or in this civil war type situation and displacing almost 8 lakh people from this cabo delgado right cabo delgado so which is a basically region and here the islamic state group basically is killing the people so this european union is basically you know inform that the military mission for the mozambique would definitely help the military exercise or the military training to support the you know the security forces specifically to the northern cabo delgado right to stop such type of violence you know in the jihadist attack so this deadly insurgency which was going on by this by this militants have claimed thousands of the life so former colonial master of the mozambique that is the portugal right have is already providing some sort of a training to the mozambique troops but that is not sufficient here some sort of a you know the military instructors on the grounds are expected to make you know this mission which was headed by the portuguese commander or the european union commander the aim of the mission is very simple to train and to support the mozambique armed forces right to protect the civilian population right restoring you know uh, the safety security specifically in cabo delgado provinces 
okay the mandate for this mission would be for initially you know for the two years only it will be there for the two years and during that two years the strategic objective will be to support the capacity building of the Mozambique armed forces and that is basically a part of the quick reaction forces as was informed by the European Union what is about Cabo Delgado the Cabo Delgado is basically the northernmost provinces of the Mozambique and uh, it is basically bordering with the neighboring country like Tanzania right where it borders with the provinces of the Nampula and the Nisesa and the Niger is basically the ethnic stronghold right with the Maconda tribe tribe where some sort of ethnic minority tribe was also there like the Makua and Bawani these tribal population are also fighting among themselves but now the problem is that there is the problem of the Islamic insurgency of the Islamic State which is basically collapse this this region of the Mozambique and which has ultimately led to right the killing of the thousands of the people and displacing almost 8 lakh people from this region okay next the solar park at the Thawada so here the NTPC is planning to set up the country's the largest solar park in the Gujarat specifically in the run of Kutch. okay so this is around 4750 megawatt of the renewable energy park at the run of Kutch in the Kivoda Gujarat will be set up by the NTPC's renewable energy limited right this renewable energy limited is the subsidiary of the NTPC limited okay it's a hundred percent subsidiary of energy NTPC which is national thermal power corporation of India limited right here this green light was given by the ministry of new and renewable energy to set up right you know 4750 megawatt of renewable energy or the solar park in the Kivoda in the Gujarat specifically at the run of Kutch so it's a very very important project right and this would be set up in the Kivoda Gujarat this uh, is this is basically you know one such project that was taken by the NTPC the NTPC has also taken the another projects in our country so this will be the first or this will be the India's largest solar power part to be built by the largest power producer like NTPC so here the NTPC renewable energy limited would go ahead right as as were given by the ministry of new and renewable energy right and under that the ultra mega renewable energy power park that is the solar park would be set up and this this would basically generate the green hydrogen on the commercial scale from the NTPC right the NTPC further also said that the commissioning of this largest floating solar you know project will basically also you know enhance this capacity so it's very very important with that aspect NTPC was also uh, established such type of solar park in Shimadri thermal power plant also in the other place which was also the floating power plant there so NTPC has given the green light by the Ministry of New and Renewable Energy on the 12th July 2021 right under you know ultra mega renewable energy solar park right and uh, this park is going to generate the green hydrogen on the commercial scale right and uh, it is basically having the ultimate aim of the building of around 60 megawatt of renewable energy capacity by 2032 which is the ambitious plan or the ambitious target right by the uh, by the NTPC or renewable energy limited with that respect okay next you have the beam UPI in the Bhutan so it's a very very important after Singapore after Singapore the Bhutan adopts the India's beam UPI right what is the beam as you know that that is Bharat interface for money okay which is basically the India's digital payment application or simply app right that works through this UPI okay which is a system that powers the multiple multiple bank accounts into the single mobile application right all right so it's clear so here the Bhutan has become the first country right the neighboring country to adopt the India's unified payment interface or the UPI standard for its for its quick response code right as it has been you know uh, confirmed by the finance minister Ms. Ms. Srimati uh, Nirmala Sitaraman as well as the Bhutan counterpart Mr. Longpo Nimpe Tesering right and uh, it is the second country after Singapore which have adopted this beam UPI right which have been you know used at the merchant locations 
right specifically for that purpose so as you know that the national payment corporation of india limited is basically an umbrella body which is providing such type of services right it's a very very important and uh, you know the the nirmala sitaraman is speaking at the virtual launch of this bhim upi in the bhutan the finance minister also said that this would also benefit the tourists right and the thousands of the tourists every year right visited from the bhutan to india and from india to bhutan so almost 2 lakh tourists from india you know travel to the bhutan every year that will basically beneficial for them and here the most important aspect is that india and bhutan have already enabled the interoperability in the acceptance of this rupee card right where every country or the other country's rupee card will be accepted that will be involved in the two phases first the rupee card issued in india right at the bhutan based terminals will be accepted and later right the rupee card issued in the bhutan at the, the terminals in india would be accepted in the second phase so as you know that during the lockdown phase because of covid-19 pandemic this bhim upi become the effective mechanism of the payment right and uh, you know it is the most important and the most attractive way of the payment that was basically attracted right with the launch of the bhim upi in the bhutan it will basically you know enhance the payment infrastructure of the two countries specifically the bhutan right that will beneficial both the countries in the large number of the tourists the businessman that has basically you know move from bhutan to india from india to bhutan and bhutan is the first neighboring country to adopt this upi standard for its qr or quick response deployment right it is the first neighboring country also and it is a proud product of india right which is a bhim upi that that you know we are sharing with the bhutan okay uh, the unite the unified payment interface is basically you know is a instant real time payment system that allow you know the users to transfer the money on the real time basis that you are you would have also experience across the multiple bank accounts without revealing the details details of the one bank and bank account to the other party so it's very very important okay and this payment system was launched by you know uh, you know the nipl right which is also the international arm of the national payment corporation of india limited so it's very very important that the bhutan has adopted our system okay it is also the great uh, the diplomatic win in that respect to adopt the india system right in that respect okay next urdu so it's a very 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 important news that the vice president bankaya naidu has received the book called urdu poets writers the gems of the deccan which is authored by the senior journalist sri js iftika so here the you know uh, the the vice president Ms. mr bankaya naidu have presented right a copy of book which is named as the urdu poets and the writers the gems of the deccan author and uh, it is basically you know uh, you know the bankaya naidu himself was basically present at the event in the hyderabad where he was basically presented this book which was offered by the senior journalist and it's a it's a basically the great facet the vice president bankaya naidu also called the urdu is the most beautiful language in the world after presenting this book to him and uh, you know this book is all at, uh, all about you know addressing the events in the hyderabad as well as you know the you know the you know some sort of a uh, uh, the poets or the authors which was there during the deccan so the book is an ethnology of the prose and the poetry on the life and the works of the 51 outstanding poets right as well as the writers of the deccan region so this book basically traces the rich literacy and the cultural traditions of the deccan right from the muhammad quli qutub shah which was the founder of the hyderabad to the present times so uh, it is a very important aspect for the development of the urdu and the urdu's official status in india as the urdu is one of the the official languages under the constitution of india it is among the 15 languages of 15 indian languages right which was also written down on the indian currency notes that you you, you would have seen also and it is one of the official languages also in the state of kashmir telangana up bihar new delhi and west bengal so it's the most important uh, you know uh, aspect all right and the national council for the promotion of the urdu language is an autonomous body under the ministry of human resources and development government of india right which was set up to promote 
and to develop and propagate the Urdu languages, right? And uh, uh, the council or the National Council for Promotion of Urdu Language was in the operation in the Delhi since 1996 onward for the purpose of the promotion, development, and propagation of the Urdu languages across the country. Alright, so that's all for today. Thank you very much. We'll meet again tomorrow for our next round of prayers. Thank you.